In the beginning, there was nothing, only darkness, an all-encompassing void that surrounded my entire existence. And from that darkness, a light began to form, growing larger, approaching closer, closer, now within arm's reach. What is this light, this blinding new thing that engulfs my mind and vision? So close now, ah, my eyes, my... I was born in a small house in a small country town in the year of 1990. At the time, home births were still a common practice, but birthing a child outside of a hospital came with its dangers. When the midwife pulled me out of my mother's womb, a problem was instantly clear. My umbilical cord was wrapped around my neck, leaving me blue-faced, not breathing, and seemingly dead. Not even a minute into living, and I was already looking for a way out. Well, for whatever reason, the midwife untangled the cord and revived me to life, and so spawned Rusty Cage. As I grew through my first few years, it became apparent that something was wrong. I never stopped crying as a baby, but once I did stop, it wouldn't be until the age of four that I spoke my first word. Why? I spent most of my young life silently sitting in the dirt, poking at ants with a stick. When I was five, I attended a daycare center where one day a girl my age came up to me on the playground and bit me on the arm. When I told the counselors what happened, they simply responded, well, bite her back. I did. Years later, I found out this girl lost her arm in a freak mechanical accident. Not my fault. As a frail and oddly silent child in elementary school, I would spend my time alone reading the newly released Captain Underpants book series, which inspired me to start drawing my own comics, mainly one called The Stimpy Show, about the aftermath of the cartoon Ren and Stimpy, where Ren became a washed up bum while Stimpy hosted a successful television show. Unfortunately, all of these comics were later lost while moving to a new house. In fifth grade, I made friends with a fellow who went by the name of Brock. He was a cooler middle school kid who wore gothic clothing and spiked his hair up into liberty spikes. Young and impressionable, I thought this was the coolest guy ever and I wanted to be just like him. So as I entered into middle school, I started spiking my hair the exact same way. Only to find out that in the Florida country town where I went to school, wearing all black and having liberty spikes just made you stand out as an easy target for bullying. After a year or two in my new school getting called a faggot all day for my ridiculous hairstyle, I realized that I should probably stop. It also didn't help my coolness much that I played trumpet in the school's band. But hey, I was pretty good at it. I was one of the top chair trumpet players for two years in symphonic and jazz band. Until it came time for us to have to practice marching band in order to perform in a few local parades. Frick that, it's hot as hell in Florida, and the last thing I wanted to do was march around for hours in the sun with a tuba blasting in my ear. And besides, I'm a lone wolf. I go my own way. So I decided to quit the band. By 8th grade, I dropped my ridiculous spiked hair and replaced it with the coolest new hairdo of the time. The center part bowl cut. I was finally making more friends and starting to do new things like skateboarding. And as I entered into high school, I was no longer that strange, potentially autistic quiet kid with no friends. Now, I was a part of a skateboard gang. A rebel. But in the town where I lived, there really weren't many good skate spots. So my friends and I would spend most of our time skating in the parking lot out in front of the local grocery store after hours. Being the young and antsy teens that we were in such a small and boring town, we started getting into mischief making. <sighs> oh my god, I hate drawing on a whiteboard. It sucks ass. And seeing as this is a 15 minute video, I think I'm gonna switch things up a little bit and only do some of the drawings on a whiteboard, some of them on an iPad, and even some of them on paper in traditional fliporama style. You know, just to make things interesting. Anyways, back to the story. At the age of 16, myself and three friends decided to break into a concession stand at our town's local community sports field. Expecting to find a stockpile of candy and soda that we could steal, we found the stand to be empty, except for a large slushy machine, which we stole instead. And well, soon after, the four of us were found out, arrested, and brought to juvenile detention until our sentencing trial. I tell this entire story in great detail in a three-part video series, which I'll link in the description. Well, fortunately, we didn't have to spend long in jail, but were sentenced to a half year on house arrest until the full duration of our trials were completed. During my time on house arrest, I was confined to my home, only being able to leave to go to school. I was just finishing up 10th grade and was losing my mind with boredom, not being able to partake in all of the fun youthful activities that my peers were. And in my mind-numbing boredom, I decided to start learning to play guitar 
guitar and write songs. Now I had taken a few piano lessons in the past, but never had too much interest in music until I realized that I could make my own. And well, I guess stealing that slushy machine changed my life for the better, because music would be the path that I would follow for years to come. Eventually, I graduated high school, doing my best to stay out of trouble. And as a fresh 18-year-old adult, it was time for me to move out of my parents' house. The world was my oyster. I had ambition. I had drive. And I was going to follow my dreams of recording my own songs and upload them to MySpace, where I was convinced that I would get discovered by millions of adoring listeners and become a great success, like so many other musicians musical acts were doing at the time. Unfortunately, this did not happen. Instead, I found myself working 12-hour night shifts for H&R Block's online tech support, waking up as soon as the sun was going down, going to work at the office, and spending long nights walking customers through tax filing software, only to come home knowing that the next day would be exactly the same. After months of monotonous, soul-sucking workdays, I started slipping into an existential depression. Is this all that life has to offer me? Is this all I have to offer the world? No time for music. No time for fun. No time for living. No time for love, Dr. Jones. Only day after day of work. If I was to kill myself, what difference would it make? Nothing I do or anyone does will be remembered in a thousand years. So why bother doing anything at all? I was losing my mind. I would come home from work to my small bedroom and talk to my cat, trying to explain my frustrations of life, only to find that even my cat didn't seem to care. She just wanted wet food. All that I could do to stay sane was channel my negative emotional state into music. And so I made my first YouTube channel and started recording videos covering various songs. It helped to distract me from my pathetic life, but it wasn't until I decided that I wanted to record my own album that I was able to finally overcome my depression. And so I spent the next few months writing and recording what would eventually become my first album. Being able to express my depression through lyrics allowed me to come to grips with the fact that the universe didn't care if I existed or not. So frick it, I'm gonna keep on trucking. So I finally quit my shitty tech support job and moved out of my small town and into the giant metropolis of Gainesville, Florida. Now, just having turned 20 years old, I worked a few odd jobs. One where I would drive around to people's homes whenever they were late on their mortgage payments, leave notices on their door, and take pictures of their house to send back to the mortgage companies. This was a sketchy job, and people would constantly call the cops on me because, to them, it looked like I was casing their home to later burglarize. I did this for about a year before eventually settling into a secure job as a used cell phone salesman. It was around this time that I uploaded a short little YouTube video of me playing Five Finger Flay while singing a song I wrote to it. Little did I know that this would later jumpstart my YouTube career. I had been on YouTube for nearly five years, and while admittedly I wasn't taking it seriously, my channel wasn't growing. By March of 2013, I only had about 1,600 subscribers. But all of that quickly changed when my previously uploaded video of me performing what is now known as the Knife Game song started to go viral. Two years after I originally uploaded it, people began posting their own videos of them playing and singing the song. And this snowballed, growing into a trend once someone posted it to Reddit. Soon after, all the news media sites were talking about it. Deemed the internet's most dangerous game by Gawker, or one of those piece of shit sites, the Knife Game song had become a sensation, and I was finally beginning to see views and subs coming to my channel. So, of course, I released a few more videos to further capitalize off its success. Within in the next two months, I had grown over 50,000 subscribers. How exciting, I thought. YouTube was finally starting to go somewhere. Well, the knife game trend continued to grow all around the world until it reached the eyes of television producers working on a new game show in Germany. They wanted to fly me out to Germany to compete against other contestants to see who could play the knife game the fastest. And the winner would take home a cash prize of 50,000 euros. So after training for a few months, I flew to Europe, competed on the show, and I won. I also made a video talking more in depth about this event, so check the description for a link to that. After receiving my cash prize, I was pretty confident that YouTube was the way to go, and so I decided to do the irresponsible thing and quit my job as a cell phone salesman. I mean, why not? What did I have to work for? I had some cash in the bank and 50,000 YouTube subscribers. The only thing that could possibly go wrong would be if YouTube demonetized my three popular knife game videos. Which they did, and so started the downward spiral of losing money rather than making it. 
I spent that year partying constantly, buying things I didn't need, and developing a drinking problem while almost entirely ignoring YouTube. I was rarely uploading new videos, and I suppose all of this debauchery and lethargic laziness finally caught up to me. Just after my initial success on YouTube, I had neglected it and let my channel run into the ground. What was I doing with my life, besides quickly burning through my game show winnings? If I didn't get my shit together soon, I would have to go back to selling used cell phones, which I really did not want to do. And so I decided that I would enroll in a two-year college program for video production to actually learn how to work a camera, how to edit, and how to make better videos altogether, which definitely improved the quality of my later content. Throughout 2015, I continued uploading videos, trying to get my channel back on track. There were a lot of music covers, original songs, experimental videos, and of course, a few more knife game songs, which surprisingly were still consistently getting a lot of views. Apparently, little kids love of the knife game. And since there's always a new influx of children coming to YouTube, knife game videos were in a continuous demand. But if I didn't already mention this, I hate kids. Anyways, my channel had finally reached 100,000 subscribers in November of 2015. This was a huge landmark for me, and golly was I proud. Not long after, I was contacted by a producer for America's Got Talent who had seen my knife game videos and wanted to fly me out to California to appear on the upcoming season of their show. So I took up the offer, flew to LA, and performed the knife game song blindfolded in front of Simon Cowell, Mel B, Heidi Klum, and Howie Mandel, as well as a few thousand audience members. I gotta say, I was nervous as hell, and even though I performed the act flawlessly, I unfortunately only got two votes of the necessary three to move on to the next round. Frickin' Heidi Klum and Simon Cowell apparently weren't impressed. I guess having some filthy 26-year-old playing with knives wasn't a compelling enough story for their shitty, rigged show. They even cut out my audition from even airing in the episode. Whatever. It was an interesting experience, I guess. Waste of time. In the following months, I graduated from my college program, released my third album, and after constantly getting pestered by children, commenting on all my videos, begging for more knife game songs, more knife game, more knife game songs, Rusty. <sighs> I knew that it was time to kill off the series for good. The very same videos that had brought me initial success on YouTube had now become a cancer trying to kill me. I now had 600,000 subscribers, and yet it seemed like all any of them wanted was more and more of the same knife videos. On top of that, the adpocalypse had come through and essentially killed off all of my income from YouTube ad revenue. So what was I to do? I knew that I had to get back to focusing on what I loved, so I took a short break from YouTube to record my fourth and most recent album, Gangstalkers. And when my break was over and recording was finally done, I was ready to get back into making videos and rebrand my channel. I was finally ready to do things right. So in the beginning of 2017, I flew out to Japan and made a video in the suicide forest with Super Tokyo Man. I released my fourth album, which saw more sales than any of my previous ones put together, collaborated with other YouTubers like Mumkey Jones, and even just recently flew to Manchester, United Kingdom, to watch the Logan Paul vs. KSI fight as part of another collab video with Nerd City which if you haven't watched that video yet, you should. I'll link to it in the description. Over these past few months, I've been lucky enough to meet and work with a lot of great content creators as I continue to grow my channel until finally, after nearly 10 years on YouTube, I reached the glorious goal of 1 million subscribers. Now they always say congratulations. congratulations. So hard, how to vacation. But to be honest, I have no idea how I got here. I'm confused by it. Most of my subscribers don't even watch any of my videos at all. And for those who do, I am grateful. But well, if I'm going to be real with everyone, having a million subscribers used to be a huge milestone. But with more and more content creators coming to YouTube every day and growing their channel to incredible sizes at incredible speeds, 1 million subscribers nowadays is pretty much the same as what 100,000 subscribers was 3 years ago. Whatever. I'm still glad that I made it this far. But deep down inside, I know the truth. That no matter what I do, no matter how big I grow my channel, I am still always going to be just another Z-list YouTuber. But hey, what can you do but own it? Which is why I'm selling Z-List YouTuber shirts in my merch store. So all you other Z-Listers out there can show your pride. 
not a YouTuber, there's also Z-List celebrity shirts, as well as many other designs and products available in a multitude of colors, and even women's sizes for all of the ladies out there. Pretty much, there's something for everyone, so be sure to follow the merch link in the description and check it out. And as always, stickers, pins, and digital and physical copies of all of my albums are available at rustycage.bandcamp.com. If I can just convince 100% of my subscribers to buy just one of these products, well hell, I'll be a millionaire in no time. But of course, that's not gonna happen. And so I wanna give a huge thank you to everyone who supports my channel on Patreon. For everyone who donates, I offer different rewards like free album downloads, stickers and physical albums delivered to your door, 25% off merch store discounts, and much, much more. So if you enjoy my content and feel it in your heart to contribute, consider becoming a patron. Well, YouTube, it's been fun so far. Thank you all for watching, and stay tuned for more videos to come.